All right, folks, welcome to Healthcare Unfiltered. I'm very excited about today's episode, partly because I'm actually not hosting the, uh, this episode. I have a guest host who has been a previous guest on the Healthcare Unfiltered, Dr. Ralph Weizelbaum, who, as you know, he is anything but filtered. So it's going to be great. Um, and um, we will do some quick introductions before we get started. But, but really, the, the purpose of today's podcast is talking about radio pharmaceuticals. And as you know, sometimes when you're a host of any kind of show, you get a little bit selfish. So you try to uh, bring topics that you want to learn about yourself. And I realize there's so much happening in the radio pharmaceutical world that very few people are really aware and have, have a grasp on. And as a medical oncologist myself, I'm a little bit embarrassed, frankly, with the little I know uh, enough about radio pharmaceuticals. So the goal of today's podcast is to simplify what I believe is a complex topic. And hopefully by the end of today's episode, you will learn more about it and, uh, and we'll take it from there. So I'm going to ask my guests to do a quick introductions about themselves, and then I'm going to kick it off to our guest host, uh, Ralph. So Freddie, maybe a little bit about you, where you are, what, where you practice, and some background. Sure. Uh, my name is Freddie Escorcia. I'm a physician scientist and radiation oncologist here at the National Institutes of Health. Um, I have sort of a, a, an appointment on the molecular imaging branch where there's a lot of preclinical and clinical development in radio pharmaceuticals for imaging and therapy. And then I see patients on the radiation oncology branch uh, and we treat them with a classic external beam radiation. Uh, I'm originally from Central America and Nicaragua. So I'm an immigrant uh, and uh, I did my you know, undergrad in Chicago, or sorry, in uh, Urbana-Champaign, so in Illinois, and then I did my uh, MD PhD at, uh, in New York City, and I was there for residency at Sloan Kettering as well. And you're a first time appearance on Healthcare Unfiltered, but it's not going to be the last time. <laughs> there we go. Yes, Jeff, a little bit about you. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Jeff Mahalski. I am a professor of radiation oncology at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm the vice chair and oversee the clinical program uh, here at uh, WashU. Uh, and I'm also a president-elect of the American Society of Radiation Oncology. That's Thank wonderful. So we have, we, first of all, congratulations. And we Thank have you. the right people on the right physician, the right panelist, because once you have the right folks, you know you're going to get the information. Our guest host, Ralph, a little bit about you and then kick it off. Sure. I'm, I'm Ralph Exelbaum. I'm a radiation oncologist at the University of Chicago. I'd like to thank both Freddie and Jeff. My interest in this well, goes way back since I'm older than both of them. So I'm fond of saying when it comes to isotope therapy, I'm certified but not qualified. And the cancer service line at our hospital wanted to develop a program. And I started reading about it and Chadi uh, asked me to come on and talk about it. And the more I read, the more I realized I didn't know much about it. And at faculty meetings, independently, both the, the faculty suggested we have Freddie and Jeff uh, give us seminars and give us advice. So I'm grateful to you both for doing this. So uh, I'm not a, an experienced interviewer, uh, certainly not uh, like Chadi, but maybe I could ask uh, Freddie and then Jeff, Freddie, could you explain to the general audience what isotope therapy is? And then maybe Jeff, when he's done, amplify it and tell people what their agnostics really are. Sure. So what we're really talking about here is, is taking advantage of the natural uh, emissions, radiation emissions of different uh, radioisotopes and using them for various clinical purposes, right? So, you know, we're familiar on the clinical side of using F18 fluorodeoxyglucose positron emission tomography for diagnostics. Um, and uh, we take advantage of, of the positron emission. On the therapeutic side, we're really talking about beta particle emission. Uh, so that's an electron or alpha particle uh, uh, emission, which is a helium nucleus that gets ejected from an unstable nucleus. Um, and basically we are harnessing those, um, uh, those uh, types of emissions for therapy. They can cause damage to DNA canonically um, or to other um, uh, subcellular components. Uh, the idea being that that ultimately can cause cellular death. So on the sort of zooming outside beyond the, uh, the, the, the isotopes, we're talking about being able to potentially localize these isotopes to targets that we care about that might be overexpressed on tumors or the tumor microenvironment. Jeff, would you like to talk a little bit about what a theragnostic is and maybe amplify what Freddie said? 
Yeah, so as, as the name implies, Theranostic is uh, a combination of a therapeutic um, and you know, right now, uh, probably the best example of that uh, is uh, lutetium, a PSMA, and a diagnostic. And the corollary to that would be either like gallium, a PSMA, or um, F18 a PSMA. So, so you you use the diagnostic to uh, first of all establish uh, whether or not the patient has lesions that uh, are metastatic and take up. Uh, the PSMA specific um, ligand, and then uh, the, uh, the the therapeutic is then linking that same uh, molecule to a payload that will deliver uh, a therapeutic ionization. And lutetium or I one thirty one, or as as Freddie was saying, even some alpha emitters are uh, being explored uh, for this type of ligand therapy. Um, if I can then ask maybe Freddie, and then I'll ask Jeff a different question. Um, it, can you talk a little bit about what I would call the non-specific isotope therapies, radium-223, uh, uh, I guess I-131 to a certain degree for thyroid cancer, perhaps? Sure. So one of the early examples of, of using um, uh, radioisotopes for therapy is I-131 uh, or another iodine isotopes for thyroid um, uh, pathologies, including thyroid cancers. So what we're really talking about there is taking advantage of the sort of natural physiologic uptake of these isotopes in various organs. Um, so the thyroid takes up iodine uh, uh, because it uses iodine to make thyroid hormone, and we can take advantage of that um, for uh, treating some thyroid cancers that take up iodine. Um, for radium-223, samarium, and strontium, they're, they're, they both localize to areas of bone turnover. So we take advantage of these to help treat bony metastases that may be painful. Um, the radium-223, or otherwise known as Zofiga, was approved in 2013 uh, after it demonstrated an overall survival benefit compared, compared to placebo in the Alsimka study. So that we, we, we use in patients who have metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer with bone-limited disease. So if I can stay on this topic for a minute, it, it, what is the actual data? Because I tried to look this up. In uh, there's a lot now on risks of I-131 versus benefits in high-risk local disease. Maybe Jeff, you want to jump in on this. Uh, but also, what's the data for metastatic well-differentiated thyroid that it actually prolongs survival? I mean, it's a standard of care, but I've tried to look this up. Has there ever been a trial to conclusively demonstrate this? Either, either Jeff, do you want to try? Yeah, no, I'm. I, I agree. The um, the use is pretty much uh, dogmatic, almost uh, based on uh, what we understand the physiology to be, and, and it's been used for a long, long time. Uh, certainly, um, based on I one thirty one scans post therapy, we know that the the isotope does eradicate uh, uh, iodine avid cells. Most likely, we're talking about thyroid cancer. Um, but to my knowledge, there's not been a, a randomized trial of I-131. I-131 um, you know, uh, has been around so long. Um, <laughs> I don't want to say it predated uh, phase three trials, but- uh, It the, did, the no, rigor, it did, yes. Yeah, yeah. The, the rigor of, of clinical investigation um, uh, kind of came after the adoption of I-131 therapy. You know, the, 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 the thing about thyroid cancer, uh, like even, you know, prostate cancer is that it has a very wide spectrum of behavior. Um, and, and our challenge is determining uh, who has a cancer that is potentially lethal versus one that uh, uh, people live with for decades without therapy. Um, we, we, we've tried to use clinical parameters to help understand who might benefit, whether there's extrathyroidal extension, um, even lymph node metastases may not necessarily predict for bad behavior as much as extrathyroid extension. So, so um, you know, we've we've used a lot of I one thirty one in thyroid cancer, and I think over the years, just like we're learning for other uh, types of cancers, there there are uh, situations where we use it in the past that are, is rep represents overtreatment, um, and and trying to find you know that sweet spot where uh, patients who will benefit should receive it is is an ongoing area of investigation for sure. Yeah. Fred, do you want to say anything about that? 
I really don't have anything else to add. I think Jeff did. Yeah, what job. struck me, because I tried to look this up before the podcast, was it's very hard to find in metastatic disease. Uh, I, I, we've all assumed it helps. I mean, Jeff's right. You look, it's avid, you know, but the, the natural history of well-differentiated metastatic thyroid cancer is very long. And it's a little tough to tell that it helps, but uh, do either one of you w- w- want to say anything about the potential risks of I-131? Well, there's just yeah, a well, paper. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. Well, obviously uh, you know, you're delivering whole body radiation um, and uh, th- there is evidence that if you start to exceed cumulative lifetime doses, I, I think uh, the numbers are around 800 uh, millicuries uh, uh, in a person's lifetime, you start to see an increased risk of leukemia uh, and other hematologic disorders, myelitis, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we, we, we pay close attention to the um, a cumulative dose that uh, people might receive over over a number of years. You know, that, the thing about thyroid cancer is is, uh, is when we treat these patients, they're treated over over years. Um, uh, we might uh, check um, uh, I-131 scan or the thyroid globulin in six months, 12 months, um, and determine, just depending on what that might show, uh, give them another dose of, you know, 75, 100 millicuries, um, uh, but, um, it really is is kind of a long, prolonged uh, uh, administration. Hey, Ra- Ralph, can I just ask a quick question before we move on to the next topic? Just uh, um, to Freddie, Freddie, you mentioned earlier about identifying the target and then defining an isotope for the target. And um, uh, two questions here before we move on. Number one, are you saying that? if you don't have an actual target that is expressed on tumor cells and not expressed on normal tissue, then isotopes should not be used. And number two, is there, is there a minimum expression of the target that you need to find on tissue by which you can say, okay, now I can really uh, have an isotope against it? Yeah, so um, the, the isotopes that are used uh, that, that sort of passively get targeted, uh, so um, they localize to thyroid uh, tissue or thyroid cancers or to uh, the uh, bone matrix that's undergoing turnover. So those are uh, isotopes that are already approved and used and have efficacy. We can talk about the, what the data are, uh, including for strontium and samarium. But uh, they are used, and I think those are used appropriately, right? Now, for other types of uh, theranostics, you do need some target, right? Because otherwise, you're not going to get localization to where you want it, to tumors in particular, in our cases, right? Uh, and, and in particular, you need a delta. So some difference between what your normal tissue expression is and what your cancer is. Um, so you need that difference. Otherwise, you're going to be irradiating. Uh, you're going to be on target, but off tumor. And I think that distinction matters. Now, the copy number, that is how many copies of your target you have expressing on, on the surface of your tumor, uh, that will also uh, dictate how much you get accumulation, how much of this you get accumulating into the tumors. Um, what that number is specifically for each cancer and which each targeting ligand, I think that differs, uh, but the more, the better. And in particular, the more that you have that is uh, above and beyond what is expressed in normal tissue, I think it's going to be critical. Very good. The, the other thing I just add, I had heard a paper a couple of years ago at the Prostate Cancer Foundation where with samarium or radium, they did some experiments in mice and they found out that it really wasn't taken up much by the tumor cells, but more by the osteoblastic cells and it destroyed the nerves in the bone and it was the pain, which is good, of course, but it's, it, it, it was sort of unexpected that maybe it didn't kill tumor cells. So... Jeff, maybe I'll ask you this. Would, would you talk a little bit about now we're on to targeted and to amplify what Freddie says about PSMA, uh, lutetium, and how it's used and what your experience is? Yeah, so uh, we were part of the vision trial, um, which uh, uh, randomized patients to receive a best standard of care versus I'm sorry, uh, lutetium. Jeff, I- Ch- Ch- Chatty just uh, emailed me. So can you explain what PSMA is? I apologize. It's a general one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, PSMA is prostate-specific membrane antigen. As the name implies, this protein is expressed on the surface of, of the uh, uh, prostate cell. Um, actually, uh, it's a transmembrane uh, protein. And early 
uh, diagnostics, um, I think the prostacent uh, scan um, was targeted at the um, internal uh, part of the uh, protein, which which made it difficult to to be as sensitive and specific as as the new modern agents, which target the surface, the prostate the specific membrane antigen uh, on the surface of of the cell. So, uh, getting back to, to the vision trial. Uh, we participated in that study, enrolled um, uh, uh, quite a few patients uh, at Washington University, and uh, patients are randomized to best standard of care uh, versus uh, uh, best standard of care plus lutetium PSMA. Um, these patients uh, were pretty late uh, stage, late phase of their um, uh, 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 treatment paradigms. Um, they had to have failed uh, uh, docetaxel, uh, and some of them have failed multiple taxanes. Uh, they also had to have failed at the time um, any of the androgen receptor axis therapies like um, uh, enzalutamide or abiraterone. And, and so uh, it really was um, very little options left for these patients. Um, and so, uh, randomized to best standard of care. Best standard of care could have been uh, ketoconazole or steroids or external beam radiation therapy or, or uh, opioid narcotics. So not, not a very effective therapies by today's standard, even though it was, it's been a modern a trial. Um, and the study was uh, reported at ASCO uh, last year and then published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few months later. And uh, uh, it demonstrated a, a rather large uh, improvement in overall survival and um, progression-free survival in, in the men who received the lutetium uh, PSMA product compared to the standard of care. Um, and, and that led eventually to the FDA approval uh, just about five months ago uh, of what is now called Pluvicto. Uh, it's <clears throat> lutetium PSMA uh, produced by uh, Novartis. Now, one important um, eligibility criteria for randomization was patients had to have a diagnostic uh, PSMA imaging a test. In, in this case, it was um, gallium PSMA 11, uh, which is uh, very much an analog of the lutetium PSMA 617 produced by the same company, Novartis, and its trade name is Locomets. Um, and so when the FDA approved uh, lutetium PSMA uh, therapy for patients who have failed um, the taxanes and um, ARAT drugs, androgen receptor ac access drugs, uh, they had to have a, a positive a PSMA, gallium PSMA 11 scan. And now there are actually two companies that make, make that uh, imaging product. Um, but there's another PSMA imaging product on the market as well, uh, uh, PYL, uh, F18 PYL imaging, uh, now the trade name is Polarofi. Um, and so you know, some patients may have a positive PYL scan. And uh, so we're, we're still navigating whether or not an insurance company or Medicare will allow that uh, PYL scan to determine eligibility for uh, lutetium of PSMA. Uh, uh, you know, no one wants to have to do a PET scan twice uh, to get the same information. So uh, a lot of this is very new. So we're, we're kind of learning the landscape. Well, before I leave, we leave this, it, um... Why, why did it take so long to get approved in the United States? It was approved. In, I had patients go to Europe for five years. Uh, you know, who, anybody who could afford it would go to Germany or to the Netherlands to get it. Do you have any idea? Well, um, I, I have some opinions. <laughs> yeah, well, that's okay. That's my <laughs> podcast. Yeah, filtered so, opinions. So, just, just don't put yeah, them on Twitter yeah. like I do, or you get in trouble. Yeah, well, I, I, there there wasn't phase three data to support this, so uh, there was there was striking, you know, uh, phase two data, but you know, with phase two data, you're always um, concerned about patient selection, uh, patient dropout, crossover, um, and 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 we face that too. Is is patients who are randomized to control. Would, would sometimes try to go somewhere else uh, and enroll in the same study, uh, you know, have a second roll at the dice. That happened very rarely, but uh, there, there were reports of that happening. Um, and so uh, this, this study, you know, phase three randomized, I, I think one could debate about the quality of the standard of care arm because today we wouldn't um, 
uh, offer some of uh, alternative um, ARAT drugs or other chemotherapies. Um, but um, uh, I, I think the, the FDA uh, approved it based on the vision trial being uh, well controlled. Um, uh, U.S. sites, it was an international study, but the, uh, many U.S. sites were represented and um, obviously very positive results. Yeah, that's, that's a great explanation. Uh, so I have some more questions about peptides, but maybe, uh, Freddie, could you talk a little bit about uh, lutetium dota tape for PNE, for neuro, the dermal tumors, and because it relates to this. Sure. Great um, explanation, Jeff, by the way. Yeah. So you know, just before tackling the peptide uh, deal, you know, a lot of the different biomolecules you could use uh, to target um, these, these, these molecules that are overrepresented on cancers, um, you can span the gamut. So um, you can talk about uh, full length antibodies, you know, we can engineer these things to be specific to whatever we want. But, right? So as long as you're, I was going to save this, but okay. okay. So I, I was reading up on this yeah, uh, and it sounds to me like the antibody labeled antibodies in general, but especially in prostate, don't work very well. Mm -hmm. And it's a little tough to get at it. But talking to people, it seems to me that these isotopes destroy the specificity of the antibody. And so, uh, so when you look at really what works, and I was going to get if we have time, we'll get to the Bexar, yep. uh, you know, yep. Zevelin controversy, but. But it seems to me that, that both for PSMA and for the Dota take that you can definitely say the stuff works. I mean, as much as anything works, the rest of it seems to me to be pretty nebulous. So I, I was going to save the antibody development for the end, but as long as you brought it up. Oh, well, all right. Well, so, um, well, yeah. So one of the challenges you have to take, take into account whenever you're dealing with the biomolecules that are specific to these targets is what the pharmacokinetics are. Right. So with a peptide, the blood half-life in general are really, really short. Uh, and with antibodies, are they're much larger, so they tend to circulate uh, for weeks, days, um, et, et cetera. So if you directly label these biomolecules, um, you, you could have irradiation of the blood pool with antibody for uh, weeks at a time. All right. And that can cause some toxicity. You can think about whether you get penetration of these larger molecules into the tumor to access the cells and, you know, how much activity are you, um, uh, or how much absorbed dose are you actually delivering to these tumors. Right. Yeah. Um, and we could talk about whether we should be focusing on solid versus liquid tumors too. Right. Uh, all right. So then with peptides, um, you, uh, you, you, in general, think that you're going to get much better penetration into solid tumors. Um, and uh, I, I think that that's, that's a key component to sort of think about. Now, the Netter 1 study, uh, so sort of answering your original question, Ralph, uh, was the phase three uh, trial that uh, randomized patients with um, SSTR, so somatostatin receptor expressing neuroendocrine <laughs> tumors. Um, uh, to either um, uh, standard of care, so cold octreotide, versus um, the radio labeled dotatate, so lutetium dotatate, and the dotatate is basically a modified octreotide with a dota, which is a chelating molecule that can bind to these radio metals, right? So now you have a radio pharmaceutical that's targeted to the somatostatin receptors, and they demonstrated an interim analysis and overall survival benefit uh, and PFS benefit. But then in the, the, the final report, uh, longer follow-up, the OS didn't hold up, but PFS was still there. And importantly, I think uh, for these, the quality of life uh, 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 aspects were improved compared, um, well, maybe not necessarily in this study, but in, in other studies where uh, other standards were, were, were given, including the therapy study, which I think we haven't touched base on yet for lutetium PSMA. Uh, Jeff, do you want to add anything? Because these are the two big or two big uses for this. Yeah, yeah you know, I would. Um, one thing I tell patients is that uh, these drugs are radioactive all the time, right? Uh, they're radioactive when we see them. They're radioactive in the vial. They're radioactive as we inject them. They don't wait to get to the um, target before they emit radiation. And, and that get, gets to, to Freddie's point is that if you have a, uh, a drug that has um, a long half-life in your, in your um, blood pool, it's going to uh, be radiating uh, off-target things for a long, long time. And, and therefore there's where you get more toxicity, um, uh, uh, both bone marrow and other, you know, when we speak of antibodies, they're taken up not just by the cell that was targeting them, but the whole uh, RE system, reticulum endothelial system, so spleen and liver, 
also take up uh, the um, antibodies. And so um, that, that's where you, you run into toxicity. Um, so these, these more selective uh, molecules that are uh, of shorter half-life uh, seem to have a little bit uh, better tolerance. Good. Uh, also, I just, you know, one thing that always struck me as a little strange, the drug antibody conjugates uh, like HER2 seem to work. <clears throat> when, when I say work, I mean, you know, maybe not curative, but they seem to work where the radio labeled antibodies don't seem to work. And that always seemed to be, to be strange because tumor cells evolve drug resistance pretty easily. I've never heard of a cell resistant to an alpha particle. So I wonder if there's something about actually uh, Jeff's comments, notwithstanding, um, uh, if there's something about the linker aspect of the isotope to the antibody, you know, maybe single chain antibodies would be better or camelid antibodies or something like that. Yeah, I can sort of chime in a little bit on that. So the linkers uh, do matter, right? Because, uh, you know, if these antibodies are internalized, then you can deliver the payload. So you can have these acid uh, cleavable linkers uh, in the ADC realm, so antibody drug conjugates, and then you release the cytotoxic cargo specifically in the cells that took up the antibody. With the radioisotope uh, stuff in general, we're talking about, even with alphas, right? We, we're, we, we go through several cell um, uh, diameters. So even though we target one particular cell, the alpha particle can traverse several other cells in the vicinity that may not be, um, that may not have the target. Um, and th that's even uh, more the case for, for beta particle emitting um, uh, uh, radio conjugates, right? Um, so I think the linkers do matter, uh, whether or not your, uh, your antibody gets internalized or your, your, your molecule gets internalized into the cell also matters. Um, uh, so there's a, there's a lot of things at play. With these other uh, antibody fragments and even camelids, one of the things that we have to worry about, and this is true for, for, for peptides, um, yeah, uh, I saw, I saw Chadi's uh, <laughs> question. Um, one of the things to keep in mind with the biomolecules is that the smaller fragments that you have of an antibody, the higher the likelihood you get, uh, accumulation in the kidneys. So then you start worrying about depositing radioisotopes, uh, into the kidneys and that can result in some, some, uh, uh, sort can of I ask you a uh, comment? Chadi raised two questions. One about giving multiple uh, installations and the second about what's an alpha, what's a beta, what's a gamma. Sure. Sure. Um, so in general, um, you, you can offer these in the clinical sites, uh, give several cycles, um, anywhere from four to eight, depending on, 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 on the, the agent. Um, and uh, maybe Jeff can sort of chime in on, on other particulars there. But as far as um, uh, the, the alpha, beta, gamma emissions, these are just different types of radiation emissions. I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but a beta particle is just an electron that gets ejected from uh, a radioisotope, and an alpha particle is uh, a helium nucleus. And you can imagine that a helium nucleus has a lot more mass than an electron, so it actually doesn't traverse, it doesn't travel very far. And the energy that it has, which is a lot, is all deposited over a short path length on the order of uh, a handful of cellular diameters. Uh, a beta particle can travel millimeters, depending on the energy. Jeff, would you like to yeah. add anything about how yeah. many times you give it in? Yeah, so, so it's interesting, you know, the, the older isotopes like uh, strontium and samarium, uh, we would give just one dose and then wait if the patient progressed, uh, we might consider a repeat dose. Uh, radium uh, was tested in uh, l -Simca to administer six cycles. Uh, most patients didn't make it to the sixth cycle. Um, they too had very late stage disease, uh, but it can be administered uh, multiple times, uh, usually every uh, four to six weeks. Um, uh, the lutetium, uh, its, its schedule was uh, every six weeks. Uh, for six doses. Now there are other um, uh, radio ligands, uh, PSMA ligands that are being evaluated um, that might have- Excuse either, me for uh, one like, second. Keep... Sure. No, keep going, uh, just, keep going. No, no, yeah, keep going. The, 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 um, the, there are other radio ligands, um, uh, PSMA specific that uh, have tighter binding uh, to, the, to the PSMA. Um, and they are uh, being explored for single or two doses, uh, maybe up to four doses, um, very early phase uh, right now. Um, so I don't know that we will always see the uh, lutetium PSMA uh, uh, types of therapeutics uh, um, delivered every six weeks over you know, six doses. It could be shorter um, uh, and maybe different dosing well, as well. 
One of the intriguing things in listening to you when you describe the studies, uh, especially Jeff, when you describe the tissue studies, I'm just thinking, you know, these are tough trials to do. I mean, because, I mean, if you're randomizing patients, there's an assumption, right? that whoever gets that arm, they'll be able to handle the logistics of whatever it is that it is. So I, you know, and then how does this translate to the real world after the drug gets approved? Because we know how things go. So maybe as you progress, as Ralph will talk, you, you'll comment into how do you see that transfer to the real world? Okay, our guest host is back. I just- yeah, Sorry, the guest host had too much coffee. I, I, was, I, was, just, I was just telling Jeff that the, um, you know, as you, you know, as, as I was listening to his description of the trial, randomized trial, I was trying to think these are tough to study. Um, you know, it reminds me, you know, for, as a lymphoma person, sometimes when we try it in leukemia, when you try to randomize folks to transplant and not transplant, not comparing those transplants, but, but there's an assumption sure. that everybody can get that arm. And I think whenever you talk about isotopes, us in medical oncology, and maybe we're very naive, but in medical oncology, we, we always find delivering the isotopes logistically so difficult. So when you do an RCT for that, right. how, do you, how do you balance that? Yeah. Sure. I, I, I was going to kind of save the, because this gets into the area of controversy. I just wanted to deal with two more, if we could, two more yeah, yeah. areas and then get into the juicy stuff. Okay. So one of uh, Jeff, maybe you guys do more of this than they do at NCI. You want to comment on yttrium and liver, and does it, the yttrium make any difference? Or is it all the embolization? Uh, or you don't want to touch that one? That's, I, I, yeah, yeah, that's a, a good question. I think um, uh, there, there's some, and I'm not as familiar with this as perhaps Freddie uh, might be, but uh, we have been doing a lot of radioembolization in St. Louis. I don't do it myself. Uh, it's done by uh, my colleague, um, Dr. Kim, uh, and uh, also Dr. Henke in, in radiation oncology, and we do it along with our colleagues in, in IR. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we believe that there are alternatives that might be a little bit better than the yttrium-90 uh, spheres, uh, like SBRT, um, uh, which is delivering more targeted, uh, a higher dose. Uh, the yttrium uh, spheres are a little less um, uh, specific. You're kind of anatomically locating things, uh, um, relying on um, a, a portal uh, vasculature to deliver uh, the dose to where you want it. Um, but uh, we, we, we do a fair amount. Um, uh, I, I think we're seeing it on the decline, uh, quite honestly, as we uh, bring other uh, what we believe to be more effective therapies uh, over the Y90s. <clears throat> but um, I'm curious what Freddie thinks. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be showing my bias a little bit. I think, um, you know, we, we do a little bit better with respect to targeting on, on the um, SBRT side, I think. And I think the data quality is much better on the SBRT side, particularly of late in the last couple of years. Um, there's been a phase three study that did non-inferiority comparing radiofrequency ablation versus proton SBRT uh, in, in, in small HCC lesions, for example, and the data were uh, basically demonstrating that SBRT was non-inferior. And considering that RFA is considered a curative local treatment, um, I think that's very compelling and, and something we have to take into account. Um, so, you know, it, it is Y90, so you can do dosimetry. And there was a study that came out, um, it's called the DOSI uh, sphere study. Uh, and, and it looked like, you know, tuning the amount of activity that you're able to administer and then the subsequent absorbed dose calculations in the tumors seems to uh, improve the local control. Uh, it, they also reported survival benefit, but I don't think it was powered necessarily to, um, to comment on that. But the, the data looked pretty good. We're giving more dose. Uh, just for the listeners, SBRT stands for stereotactic body radiotherapy, where we give a high dose of radiation to a confined volume. I, I think what both our guests are alluding to, it's a lot less messy than getting hooked up and, and infused with the yttrium. My own uh, opinion, and it's just an opinion having listened to talks, is the yttrium doesn't contribute much. It's mostly the embolization. If, if you look at the dosimetry, which, which I'll come to in a minute, one more thing I want to touch either one of you guys, MIBG131 in pediatric neuroblastoma where there seems to be effectiveness and I'm sure the audience would like to know. Uh, Jeff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 
you know, one of the challenges of MIBG in the past was it, it was um, uh, not as specific as one would have liked. And, and over the past years, there's been more um, purified, uh, I guess maybe Freddie can explain this better than me, uh, a purified um, MIBG uh, tagged I-131. Uh, but it has been used in uh, pediatric neuroblastoma for uh, a couple decades. Um, uh, but limited to very few institutions because it, it is uh, a, a difficult drug to administer, a difficult drug to study. Um, but now uh, the COG is, is conducting trials with the use of MIBG um, and uh, more institutions are um, exploring its use um, and making it available. Uh, we also uh, will be administering it here in St. Louis, um, but it is a, a higher dose of uh, I-131 and uh, uh, requires an inpatient stay. Um, we used to admit uh, all the I-131 therapeutic doses for thyroid cancer until we did uh, a post-treatment um, uh, dosimetry uh, of the patient to see that actually they were uh, safe for discharge. When you use a, a, an I-131 ligand therapy though, um, uh, unlike the sodium iodide where you might eliminate a lot of the iodine in, the, in just a, a couple hours with MIBG or other ligand therapies, there is the potential for the same uh, um, activity of iodine that you're administering, uh, more retained activity in the patient and therefore may require the patient to be hospitalized, not because of uh, a medical condition, but because of a radiation protection issue. So, so you don't wanna uh, put a, a radioactive patient uh, emitting high levels of, of uh, radiation into the community. So we, we admit them and monitor their um, radioactivity uh, exposure rates and allow discharge when they get down to something like less than five mR per hour. Um, so that, that's one of the, the history of I-131, uh, the current day and you know, some of the challenges that some of these uh, at, at least the I-131 ligands oppose uh, for us. Sure, yes. So we have a faculty member, Sue Cohn in pediatrics, who actually does a lot of this, and she does a great job with Phil Cannell in our department. So now I get out, we covered the basics. Now I get on to the juicier stuff. So we talked a little about dosimetry, and Freddie's just published a paper on what radiation oncologists ought to do to, to do isotope therapy. So there's all sorts of dosimetry, but it seems to me, and this gets to uh, uh, Chatty's question, that it, it, so it's not only the range of the isotope, it's the concentration times time, as Jeff points out, for complications. And so how, how it, it, and there are, you know, MERD various computational ways to do this, but mostly they seem to me like a crock. So Freddie, what do you say to this? Um, is it a crock? Uh, uh, just to the viewer. So, so listen. <clears throat> no, in, understood. In, 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 in external radiotherapy, we define a target, and then we want to fit the dose to the target. So the trick is, among other things, to hit the target with the dose. So now I'm turning this around to Freddie and saying, Freddie, how are we going to hit the target with the dose, and how do we know what the dose is? And of course, there's one <clears throat> more than one target. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so this is a very hard question that people build entire sort of uh, careers on, right? Um, so well, a couple of things to keep in mind how this differs from external beam. External beam, we have anatomical information, we define it, and then we can use a really complex computation to, to deposit the dose that we want to the tumor and avoid to other organs. With something that is systemically administered, you have to take into account the pharmacokinetics of this thing, and that's usually not something that we that we uh, think about as, as radiation oncologists. Right? So we inject it, and it's going to circulate in the blood for some period of time. There's going to be some ramp up uh, while it accumulates in the tumor. It's also going to accumulate in some normal tissue, but then eventually clear. Uh, and there's some non sort of some nonlinear uh, decay uh, after which that agent is cleared from different organs and different different tissues. Now, so that's just the pharmacokinetics of the molecule itself. And then on top of that, you have to take into account the isotope. So, right, what's the physical half life of the isotope? So, where is it decaying? How much decay has occurred while the ligand is accumulating where it needs to accumulate and/or clearing for where it's going to be clearing? So, those complexities uh, make it very challenging to get an accurate estimation of the dose. Right. So, you know, if if you read some of the nuclear medicine literature. 
they just published a, a, a basically a challenge. You're like, here are some images using your uh, internal sort of uh, algorithms or your uh, commercially available uh, dosimetry uh, software, what doses do you calculate? And the ranges are, are all over the place, right? It's very hard. Um, so, and that's even using the same, the same data set. So I think it's something that we should aspire to, um, but I don't, I don't think we're there just yet to get accurate uh, absorbed dose es estimates. So Jeff, let me turn this on to a, even a dicier topic. Uh, so uh, Achadi alluded to this. Is this nuclear medicine? Is it medical oncology? Is it radiation oncology? Yeah. And uh, since you've done this at WashU, how, uh, how does a Department of Radiation Oncology get started in this? What, what, what do we need to do? As a self-interested yeah. specialty question. <laughs> yeah. Um, good question. I, I, actually, I was I wanted to, to say something about the dissymmetry. Oh, go ahead, that, please. I'm um, sorry. Go ahead. I go yeah. ahead. So, so, and, and I'll get back. To, I'm not trying okay. to evade. The no, question. no, no, no. Um, it's good. So, but um, you know, one of the, the challenges is, uh, as I alluded to, with like the PSMA, is that uh, these are are two different uh, molecules um, that, and, and so the the diagnostic molecule is gallium PSMA eleven. Uh, a little bit different than the uh, lutetium PSMA 617. And, and so uh, one is making the assumption that the gallium uh, PSMA 11 and the lutetium PSMA 617 are going to the same target. Uh, and, and so there, there is a little bit of indirect assumption. There are some um, agents that are, are currently being explored with say copper 64 and copper 67 which is in the, there you have the same chemistry, uh, but even that differs a little bit because as, as Freddie was alluding to, uh, the half-life of the 67 and 64 are different. And so uh, you're, you're only getting one point in time uh, when you're doing these dosimetry tests. Sometimes uh, what we would really like to see is an agent that uh, emits uh, both the therapeutic and diagnostic at the same time and you can monitor that, uh, you know, the uptake. Another thing that um, uh, was alluded to just briefly, uh, uh, Freddie mentioned the therapy trial. Uh, the Australians have been studying some of these lutetium uh, PSMA products for a bit longer than, than we have, uh, and they've done an excellent job. And um, one of the uh, uh, selection criteria for some of the Australian studies was not just a gallium PSMA, 11 PET, but also an FDG PET. Um, and and what, what they saw is that some of, you know, FDG is not commonly used to image prostate cancer, but in the very aggressive, high grade, uh, um, rapidly turning over uh, prostate cancer cells, uh, you do see FDG uptake. If they saw FDG uptake that was discordant with PSMA 11 uptake, those patients had a very bad prognosis. Um, and so uh, in, in some cases, they were excluded from uh, uh, subsequent trials because you have cancer uh, that is very active, not taking up your, 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 your medicine. So um, that's not something that the vision trial addressed. Uh, and, and so there, there could be you know, patients who progress because they have discordant uh, disease uptake. So, Although that so was very to important to know, if you look at most therapeutics, yeah. there's heterogeneity in the, of, of tumor risk, even in checkpoint, right? And so you could use other, you could use other kinds of ablations, SBRT or something like that to ablate, if, if there aren't too many of them. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. You're going to talk about one thing to insert real quick before uh, um, we go on is that while you can use the PET imaging agent to help you estimate the dosimetry, so where your therapeutic one will go, the lutetium, mm -hmm. you can also use the lutetium uh, uh, labeled agent to try to do dosimetry after you inject it uh, by capturing either planar imaging or SPECT uh, CT imaging. Um, so then it's a direct measurement of the therapeutic agent and then you, you get multiple images to try to estimate what, what, what the clearance is and then ultimately the, what they call the time activity curves, how much accumulation you get over time and then what does that translate into uh, when it comes to absorbed dose. So it's possible, it's just hard <laughs> yeah. and logistically right. challenging. Jeff, you were gonna amplify on what in a big medical center uh, Okay, so so do you want me to talk about politics or do you want me to talk about what you Well, let's talk about what you need first and then the politics. I yeah, should add that yeah. WashU's got one of the most distinguished 
nuclear medicine yeah, we do. In the Absolutely. world, <laughs> ours, we have good service. I think they're not, and we have a cyclotron, but I think it's, there's almost nothing as big and as good as the Mellencrat at Wash U. So go ahead. Jeff. Je Je Jeff, remember, this is healthcare unfiltered. You can say yeah, whatever you okay. want, like literally right. whatever you want. No yeah, one it, listens it, to this. It, it's it, very private. If you yeah, egg me like, on, no, I'll no one's going to come after me on Twitter after this, right? So, uh, <laughs> That, that never happened. Um, so so um, in, in, at WashU, at, at Malakrat, um, uh, radiation oncology historically has been the administrator of radio pharmaceuticals for cancer therapy. And nuclear medicine uh, was the, um, uh, the group administering therapies for benign disease like hyperthyroidism. Um, and, and we lived symbiotically like that for a long, long time. Uh, obviously, the uh, thyroid cancer patients would get IWIT-31 scans. We would do the, the, the treatment in our department. Uh, we, you do have to have um, uh, a facility that uh, has some shielding in the rooms, um, staff that are trained in the management of high doses of, of uh, these rated pharmaceuticals because managing five millicuries is different than managing 100 millicuries if there's a spill. Um, and, you know, just simple things like the, the room has to be prepped in case there is a spill um, so that it can be removed and decontaminated, uh, special toilets and bathrooms, uh, you know, grout is a lovely place for uh, reactive pharmaceuticals to hide. Uh, so the, the bathrooms have to be especially prepped and, and prepared in advance. Um, so uh, the, the, the staff, um, uh, include uh, radiation therapists, nurses, uh, obviously the radiation oncologists, but also medical physicists. The, you know, the medical physicists in, in our department are keenly involved in uh, the receipt, the measurement of the dose before we deliver it. Uh, uh, you know, there have been circumstances where we received a dose that on the vial it says one thing and it's off by uh, 10%. And it's good to know uh, that uh, you're about to treat people with the dose you intend to. Um, and then uh, you have to be able to, to watch them uh, for a short period of time after the administration. I will say that the Lutathera is unique uh, because those patients um, uh, are receiving amino acid infusions. Mm -hmm. And the reason they receive that is uh, to help um, prevent um, uptake by the, the uh, kidney tissue, the renal tubules, which would otherwise take up this lutetium uh, uh, dotate uh, molecule. And uh, so amino acids are administered for several hours after the uh, Lutathera injection. And uh, so you have to have the patient in like an infusion chair, monitoring the nursing. Uh, the amino acids can be very emetogenic. Um, so you have to have appropriate pre-medication for them. Uh, and you know, they're, they're gonna be in that chair for a couple hours, you need to have access to a, a, a a, a safe a bathroom toilet to uh, uh, use, um, particularly when they're getting infusion. Uh, so, so it is um, an environment that uh, is is unique. Um, uh, it's kind of a cross between a radiation therapy, a radiation oncology department, and a, a an infusion center uh, for, for at least for Lutathera. Fortunately, the lutetium PSMA um, it. it the injection is done over about 15 minutes. We watch them between 30 to 60 minutes afterwards uh, and, and let them go home uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, patients have to be instructed about radiation safety when they get home, um, uh, you know, how to use the toilet, uh, uh, sleeping alone if they can, um, not having young children or pregnant women in proximity. Uh, the, the usual uh, radiation safety precautions we would advise. So uh, I didn't want to run out of time, but what, what can you say something about the politics? I'll let Freddie jump in on this too, because I think it's yeah. important. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, nuclear medicine um, is one of the specialties that uh, is um, going to be involved in uh, these therapies. Uh, obviously, uh, absolutely required for the diagnostic part of, of treatment. Um, they help us select patients um, uh, and you know, determine um, uh, whether the, the isotope, the tracer that we're going to be using is being taken up by, by the patients. And, and many of the uh, nuclear medicine physicians are also authorized users to administer the therapeutic 
of doses. Um, <clears throat> but you know, the, the big question is, where do these patients come from? They come from uh, medical oncology clinics, they come from urology, uh, and uh, of course, radiation oncology. You know, so many of the patients I treat uh, uh, come from my own practice. Uh, these are patients I may have treated uh, a decade ago with external beam radiation therapy, uh, and then uh, they develop metastatic disease. I've been monitoring, treating them with hormone therapy. Uh, and then when they develop metastatic disease that is resistant to hormone therapy, I, I get the medical oncologists engaged, um, and uh, they may receive then uh, other uh, ARAT drugs uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, chemotherapy. And eventually, uh, patients might need uh, external beam radiation therapy for palliation, uh, and uh, then uh, might qualify for uh, this uh, now commercially available uh, drug. So, so you know, I, I'm involved uh, from you know early on, shortly after diagnosis, sometimes uh, until the patient's death, in terms of managing them. And so, uh, having that broad spectrum, that broad view of the natural history of their disease, I think helps us manage those patients. But at the same time, uh, we have to um, work together and collaboratively with our colleagues in nuclear medicine. Now, now a, a, a unique thing that um, uh, uh, came to my understanding uh, just in the past couple of years is um, as nuclear medicine is evolving because these new drugs are now available, um, our uh, uh, radiology department is, is uh, chaired by uh, Rich Wall, who is a nuclear medicine physician. Amazing guy, super Major. smart. Yes. Um, yeah, he, he was at Michigan, then Hopkins, and now has returned uh, to St. Louis, where he originally trained, actually. Um, and uh, Farouk Didashti, also one of our uh, brilliant uh, nuclear medicine physicians, Gary Siegel, uh, another, you know, really super people. You, you, you know them, Ralph. Yes. And... Um, uh, they uh, point out that uh, to attract the best faculty and the best trainees, uh, because nuclear medicine is now moving in this direction of what uh, uh, Rich Wall coined a nuclear oncology at the SNNMI meeting just two weeks ago. Interesting. I'm president of the Vastro. He's the uh, outgoing president of uh, the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Medical Imaging. Uh, so uh, he coined this phrase nuclear oncologist. So, so they're going that direction. So in order for them to attract uh, top, can uh, top candidates for faculty and training, uh, they need to be involved in this more directly. And so uh, we are now working collaboratively with them. Uh, we've made a proposal to the medical center to create a theranostic center, uh, similar to how we have a gamma knife center. And that would be code co-led by a radiation oncologist and a nuclear medicine physician and coordinated uh, with hospital staff uh, to, you know, so I really want it to be patient-centered, uh, patient-forward. Uh, if someone is seeking one of these treatments or a referring physician wants uh, uh, us to evaluate a patient for this, as they call the theranostic center, and um, a coordinator would then determine uh, do they need to see nuke med? Do they need to see radon? Do they need to see medoc? Um, and and have that, um, uh, like I said, patient focus and not turf uh, battles uh, between these um, uh, different disciplines. That's a great answer, and I can see why you're the president of Astro, Freddie. And then I'll make a comment too. You know, I think I think look, the nuclear medicine field, uh, particularly the very strong departments that have been you know leaders in the preclinical and then the clinical translation of these things. Um, will want to be involved. So like your Sloan Kettering's, your Hopkins, your Wash U's, uh, et, et cetera. Um, now the, the one challenge I think is that you, you, you have these historical elements at play where in certain departments, it's nuclear medicine, it's owned the whole thing. That's Sloan Kettering for us, right? Um, and, and you know, do we want to be beholden to history as we move forward, right? So I think uh, the, the paradigm that Jeff is describing, I think makes a lot of sense where uh, you, you're putting the, the patient uh, appropriately at the center. Yeah, I, I would say Wash U is special because it's got a history of outstanding radiation oncology that goes back to Carlos Perez 50 years ago. And the Mellon cried to supported nuclear medicine there. And of course, Jeff Wall, 
uh, is, is a historic figure in nuclear medicine, I think. Uh, my own view, and I told this to Chadi on our podcast, is this is essential for radiation oncology. We need to get, I think what Jeff described is what a real doctor does, right? And I think aside from any financial remuneration, we need to become involved. This is radiation oncology in the management of systemic disease. And this is a good way to do it because I could see, one reason I think that dosimetry is important and Shadi alluded to this, is that the medical oncologists don't wanna touch this stuff for all kinds of reasons. Uh, fortunately, there's not a lot of money in it right now for the doctor, and that's one reason if we have time, we can talk about Bexar and Zevelin, which uh, Jeff Wall was involved with, right? So, so nobody wants to touch it unless they have to, and I think this multidisciplinary effort is not only a good thing, but it's an essential thing. Um, and the other thing, I just got a nasty long email this morning from one of the neurosurgeons commenting on radio surgery, where you may have seen my tweets, it's radiotherapy, but the neurosurgeons get money for showing up, right? No frame. But it, it's the same historical problem where I think radiation oncology diplomatically not only has to stake out a role, but intellectually stake out a role, which I, I could see a uh, a scenario where you actually determine target volumes throughout the body, pick the right isotope and pick the right targeting agent, and it, it becomes more intellectual and more planned. So, uh, well, Freddie, I didn't mean to cut you off. Do you want to say anything else about this or what, what's your experience at NCI? Um, so we're, we're, we're rebuilding actually uh, the, the radiopharmaceutical therapy side, you know, historically the, um, uh, the group led by Steve Larson and Jorge Kersky of their nuclear medicine, uh, uh, folks, they had a really, uh, a good clinic, uh, and we're running some very innovative trials, but then it, it, it it's sort of, um, uh, you know, when they left, it, there was there wasn't much of uh, much activity, uh, pun intended. Uh, but now, one of my colleagues, Frank Lynn, he's he's a, a new generation of folks, and he's got uh, the what what he calls a nuclear oncology clinic, and he's a, a medical oncologist uh, with nuclear medicine background as well. So I think he's he's appropriately, uh, you know, uh, looking at the patient holistically here and being able to give these therapies, and he's he's very much involved. I have um, a question for our host, Chadi. What what happened with Zevelin and uh, uh, Bexar. These are anti-CD20 labeled antibodies that are labeled with I-131 and yttrium-90. I can't keep them straight, but... Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, these are good questions, and I think it's actually uh, it's a nice segue to uh, maybe a couple of other points. Um, I, there are two issues that have happened. One is logistics, for sure. Uh, I mean, to, to Ralph's point, in medical oncology, we, we, we have so much to worry about in terms of logistically and managing patients that whenever you say, I got to call five people to uh, who, somebody has to give the cold rituxin, and then I have to call the hot rituxin, and, and then I need to do the imaging, it's too complex. Logistics is definitely an issue. And and the thing is with medical oncology, we can handle the logistics when we are running the show, we can figure it out. I mean, we have so many complex treatments that we give, but the problem with, with, with Zevlin and Bexar is that the logistics are difficult. You've got like three to four cooks also. And, and honestly, it became very confusing. That was one obstacle. The second obstacle was uh, there were so many competing systemic therapies. Uh, in lymphoid malignancies. Um, so, you know, I think we there's a whole debate, the role of radiotherapy in non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma, as you both know, but it's really because so many systemic treatments. So then you end up going back and say, do I really need to go through all of this? I can give a dose of weekly rituxin. It wasn't mainly financially driven, but those are the two things in my opinion. But wouldn't, I, you think, wouldn't you think though, if it, I mean, there, there definitely was some efficacy, at least in failed- No, no, there is. I, I've, there given, was... I've given Zevalon, uh, and I've actually had very good results when I give Zevalon, but Ralph, it was pain in the ass. I mean, I'm telling you, like just to- even, I believe you. <laughs> no, no, like <laughs> just, I mean, to, just to give it. So I, the efficacy is there. I think the trials were pretty well done. I think now there are a little bit, there's so many new treatments. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But at the time when I gave Zevelin and, and I wrote a couple of papers on it, I, I believe it's actually very active, but it was like, I was just pulling my hair. Um, I don't know. That's, that's my opinion about- No, I think you're right. But I think you would think of something worked that- 
the complexity or wouldn't, uh, you know, speaking of Vinny Prasad, he's written some articles saying it didn't work, but there's a New England Journal paper by Kaminsky's first author. It seemed to me it works. I mean, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that um, Lutetium PSMA doesn't go that same way. And I, and I believe, uh, first of all, uh, metastatic prostate cancer is a much more common disease. Um, and so there's a, a, a greater market for it. But I, I think importantly, and that, that's what I'm hoping to establish with this idea of a theranostic center, is that it's patient-centered, uh, that the, the troubles that Chadi just described are um, invisible, you know, have the patient come, we will take care of the imaging, uh, the selection, communicate, of course, with medical oncologists um, uh, as, they, as they rightly need to know, um, but uh, take a lot of the hassle out of your hands and we will take care of it uh, in our own center. Freddie, if I can ask you, what do you think the future is? What, what, what area of investigation? What about uh, the, the obvious things about targeting and conjugate chemistry and pre-targeting? And, you know, what about... Uh, genomics and things like that. Yeah, so that's sort of where we're, I'm trying to uh, carve my niche here on the, the, the preclinical lab side, right? I think that we have new tools available to us that, that, that weren't previously available, or at least not a, 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 as inexpensive, right? So next generation sequencing uh, and trying to figure out what molecules are overrepresented on tumors compared to normal tissues. Um, I think that's important. We're trying to take advantage of some of these patient data sets that are already out there to identify new targets. Um, we can engineer new biomolecules, uh, so we have phage display for peptides, phage display for antibody fragments, what have you, and testing these things out. In fact, our, our, our group is trying to go deep on one particular target that we think is interesting for hepatocellular carcinoma, glypican 3 and we have a library of several molecules uh, that are specific to the target, and we're trying to see which one actually works best for this particular target uh, for this particular disease, right? Uh, so I think that's going to be pretty interesting. The linker chemistry that you mentioned earlier, I think is going to be important, particularly um, trying to uh, decouple the isotope from the biomolecule. Uh, you know, the, the, the reason that you're getting a lot of kidney accumulation on the Tates, the, the Lutathera, is because that's a natural physiologic response to, you know, peptide uh, things, right, and proteins uh, in, in the kidneys. So what if you were able to cleave off the isotope once you get to that point, you may be able to improve your therapeutic index. <laughs> You know, thinking about future, I, none of these therapies are, are, are uh, curative, I think, right now, right? Um, especially as monotherapy. So thinking about combinations, I think is important. There's some evidence suggesting that like external beam radiation, uh, uh, Radiopharmaceutical therapies can 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 turn tumors from cold to hot immuno uh, to, to respond to immunotherapy. So I think those things are on the on the horizon. You know, our target is DNA, right? So uh, combining with DNA uh, repair uh, inhibition agent inhibiting agents, I think, is critical. Uh, whether they work the same way as external beam, uh, I think that, that remains to be seen. I think looking at these specifically, I think it's going to be important. Jeff, would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I think. Um, like chemotherapy, when you find a drug that is active in late stages of disease, uh, you want to see if moving it forward in the um, uh, treatment paradigm uh, will improve outcome so patients don't transition to that late, later stage of disease. So we are right now uh, doing clinical trials in patients who uh, have not yet received the taxane, for example, so pre-taxane. Uh, lutetium PSMA. We're also looking at uh, patients who have castrate sensitive prostate cancer uh, to see if uh, we can prevent them from moving into cancer resistance. And, and actually, even in Australia, our, our colleagues down under are doing a trial of uh, lutetium PSMA in prostatectomy patients, the so called lutectomy trial. Um, so uh, I, I think you know, that's kind of where we're naturally seeing. Um, uh, the, the move, of course, um, with a radioactive drug, uh, if you start moving it earlier in the uh, condition, you have to be monitoring for late uh, toxicity, particularly second malignancies. Um, you know, uh, radium uh, has a, a legacy of uh, causing um, bone cancers. Uh, we know that from the radium workers, uh, uh, the, the women who painted uh, uh, 
uh, watch dials in, in, in the uh, distant past. Uh, so monitoring for uh, uh, those types of uh, unusual late effects is going to be very important. You guys are really brilliant. Uh, uh, thank you. Chadi, I turn it back to you. Do you have any other questions or comments? Or Ralph, this was really great. I, I learned so much. I think there are maybe just a couple of things just to uh, sure. understand. I think you, um, I forgot whether it's Freddie, Ralph, or you, Jeff, mentioned it. I'm wondering, so giving prior radiotherapy for patients, let's say, let's say you give chemo RT to the line or you gave radiotherapy to the prostate. So none of this is contraindication to giving radioisotopes later on? Um, <clears throat> no, uh, the, the volume of bone marrow that we radiate when we radiate the, the prostate um, or, other, or, the organ, or other organs is usually pretty small. So the, the concern of um, bone marrow toxicity is, is, is not really grave when, when you're doing this. Um, uh, and the 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 uh, dose rate and the specificity of of the lutetia or of the radioisotope therapy is is not the same as as you see with other uh, ex repeating external beam radiation therapy. So I, I think it's been generally pretty safe. And then just to Freddie, the, you know, I'm, in oncology, we're so excited about sequencing. I mean, you know, pretty much all tumors in advance. In, in fact, the ASCO recent statement was to sequence all advanced uh, solid tumors. And I think for, for most part, probably it's going to happen. I'm, I'm certainly um, excited more about how you link molecular findings with, uh, I think it's going to be more than just having the target. I think you guys are going to find something that if you have the target and <clears throat> maybe there's a mutation somewhere, that's the patient you need to give. I mean. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, expression, uh, so that, that, that correlates with copy number. So how many copies of your target are, are present uh, in your tumor? Uh, so I think having some idea of what that is, is going to help you know, on the discovery side. Obviously, you have to validate uh, Chadi, right? So maybe you need some other molecular markers that are there that help you enrich for a patient population that will respond. One of the cool things about this therapy is that we 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 kind of get that where we have this biomarker in the imaging uh, version of this thing, right? So we know that if you go after this target, we know the tumors take this up, so we know we can deliver. Um, the agent to these tumors. The question is, you know, what's the dose? Do we want to get uh, a little bit more nuance with the dose symmetry? How can we personalize that? So we maximize the dose of tumors while uh, avoiding toxicity. One of the things that we didn't touch on is that right now we give flat dosing in general for these things, just like we would like chemo, right? Some, some weight-based uh, dosing or uh, surface area, right? And the issue there is that, um, you know, if a patient is the same sort of size, but they have significantly more tumor burden, they may not have enough dose that we give them, enough activity compared to somebody that has lower burden of disease, we we'll give them the same, the same activity, right? So the, the low burden of disease person may have more toxicity, the person with higher may not benefit. So I think those, those, those nuances need to be ironed out also. I think they're not even nuances. It seems to me, we really don't know the mechanisms of resistance. Does the antibody or the peptide drug country not get, not get there? Are there unknown mechanisms of intrinsic resistance? maybe not in the targeted cell, but in the you know, DNA repair, for example, in adjacent cells. Personally, I think this has enormous potential because you don't even have to look for a mutant target. If you have, as uh, Freddie says, an overexpressed target, presumably there would be an off-the-shelf reagent you could get and label with an appropriate isotope. Right? So this is really only in the beginning. It's a lot like chemotherapy now. We give it because we give it, and if it works, it works, and then maybe we give more, maybe we don't. Uh, so, I, I again, I can't stress how important I think this is for radiation oncology to get into for all kinds of reasons. So, just before we part ways, my last question is usually just if any, if there was any question that Ralph and I should have asked and we just did not ask, now it's the time to speak. Jeff, anything you sh we should have uh, commented on that we just missed? Uh, I almost hate to say it, but um, the cost of these therapies is astronomical. And um, I, I don't know how to fix that. Uh, but one of the challenges that we faced at, at uh, Barnes uh, and Wash U is, is getting the, the medical center to allow us to give the drug to patients because it's so expensive. 42,500 uh, per acquisition, uh, just, just for the drug cost. Uh, 
times six doses, that's a quarter of a million dollars for a course of therapy. Um, and uh, that that is just not sustainable. Um, and, and so we need to figure a, a better way to make these, um, to produce them, to distribute them that won't break our healthcare system. Ready? That's a whole other podcast, but you're I making know. I mean, <laughs> the same thing with PD-1, right? I mean, it was a $17 yeah, billion yeah. Dollar drug. Yeah, yeah, I need to do one. I've done, I've done a couple of those, honestly, on financial toxicity, and I, I'm not sure there are answers, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, right. so someone someone made a remark on Twitter that uh, uh, the cost of two uh, chemotherapy drugs exceeded the cost of all um, radiation therapy. You know that uh, Pembro and um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I forget yeah. the other one was was more than uh, yeah. all of the <laughs> therapy. And I said I said Pluvicto says to Pembro, hold my beer. Yeah, right. So. Yeah, you know, it's um, it, it's I say the good news is we can cure cancer. The bad news is we can't afford it. Or with like indolent lymphomas, you live as long as you don't run out of money. It's getting like that in prostate cancer too. Right? I don't know what the cost of Enza and abibaterone, but they did. Uh, yeah. Nick James did the abibaterone trial in England, and it's a, it's a miracle, right? And then the British Health Service wouldn't pay for it. It's just astounding <clears throat> to me. Freddie, any other thing we should have commented on? Yeah, I think uh, just one thing to add on on sort of availability of the stuff. So I think the supply chain, the production of high quality isotope and being able to deliver it um, uh, from production uh, to to the different sites, I think is going to be important. Um, you, you may all know that earlier this year, Novartis had to shut down a lot of the, yeah. um, the, 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 the manufacturing because of some some issues. It, it was unclear what, what it actually was. Um, but that uh, ended up affecting patient care, right? Because some patients started getting these cycles and then they couldn't get the next one uh, appropriately timed. So I think uh, making sure that the, the, the supply is, is there is going to be critical. It happened to a friend of mine's brother, actually. It was awful. We had to send him. I finally got him to Berlin to get his uh, subsequent doses. Yeah. Well, Ralph, you, you're an excellent host. You can be the future doctor. Oh, these guys are easy. Are you kidding? No. <laughs> Both, I'm going to invite both of them because, I, you know, really, this is both in terms of research and application and how you do it. Uh, our nuclear medicine guys are good. You know, they told me they get $84 to read a therapeutic scan. So I think it's not likely to be too competitive. And I, but there's a lot of logistical problems. Uh, and I think both NCI and WASH are better set up than we are. But I think uh, it, it's a really important area. And I'm very grateful to both of you guys. Thank you. Thanks for inviting I, I us. Enjoyed it. Thank now, you. When the neurosurgeons come after me for Twitter, I have to come out to your place and just hide in the basement. <laughs> uh, I, need, I need to bring a neurosurgeon. I need to bring the neurosurgeon who you're discussing at Twitter. You not not to- this guy. Another one, a more rational actor. Okay. Okay, good. Well, send me, send me the information. Uh, hold on. Are you saying there are rational neurosurgeons? We just lost. Uh, yeah, there's a few, actually. <laughs> Some of my best friends. And that is actually true. Uh, this guy, is, I, I can't say. Uh, no, no, it's unfiltered. You can say, but well, he's a, a jerk. <laughs> There's jerks everywhere. Radiation oncology's got him too. Ready? The nice thing about having your own podcast unfiltered, we can say whatever you want. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Well, hey, thank you, thank you for the three of you. I really appreciate it, and uh, and uh, you know, um, uh, I hope that we're we're gonna get uh, more of this. I I feel that radiation oncology is continues to be in an, an enigmatic world for even specialists like me, honestly, not to mention the students and the residents and the fellows who don't get enough exposure. I mean, a fellow in medical oncology probably gets one to two months, an entire three to four year in radiation oncology, and then they're supposed to go to practice and figure out when to refer patients. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on Health. Thank you. Thank you, Chadi. And thank you, Freddie. And thank you, Jeff. You guys are terrific. Thank you. And thank you, thank you for Chadi. Having you're a great educator. Thank you.